going to start by distributing the sample that I was showing yesterday coming from the storage drive tunnel. You can tell that it's not as heavy uh, as steel. Um, so, you know, when I picked it up, somebody asked me, so do we need to shut down the tunnel or something? And so I said, no, probably not, because I knew it wasn't, you know, solid metal. You can have what we call exfoliation, and I was a little bit worried about that one. Exfoliation is when the corrosion essentially penetrates in the, uh, in the rolling direction, and you'll still have steel between, between the layers. Uh, in those conditions, for the given thickness, you have a lot more material loss because you have steel as part of your deposit. Uh, it's not very common, but it happens. Um, today we're going to continue um, on corrosion mechanism and I want to go back at last yesterday we we looked at that video I want to come back a little bit to that I have specific example for galvanic uh, pitting uh, and different materials just things that you should be aware will happen uh, under certain conditions then we're going to talk about corrosion protection so that's you guys yesterday were really good because it was the first class on corrosion. So the questions were ranging from like, how is it happening? And then what do you do about it? So today we're going to spend some more specific time on what to do about corrosion and how to mitigate it. And then I'll talk about stainless steel. I have some samples here that I need to think about distributing when we get there. Um, I, in the notes, I, I left it on purpose on the first lecture. The name is a poor bay diagram here that we looked at briefly at the end of last class, saying that what you like to do with steel is be in this region where the, 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 you form a stable um, oxide, hydroxide on the surface and you don't have to worry too much about um, losing a lot of thickness over time. And when I say a lot, that's what we're going to talk about also today in terms of rate. Um, the general reaction, you always have an anode and a cathode, and if you remember the, the, uh, the little video from yesterday, what happens is if I have the surface of a single material, so it's, this is a piece of steel that I just drop in the water and there's no electrical connection to another material, what happens is you have the plus and minus distributed in, in different locations, so you have you're going to have current going from, from these, these two to each other here, and you can have current here, you have current there. It's all intermixed. What happens if, if it's uniform corrosion, the plus and minus will switch over time. So the anode will become the cathode and vice versa. Um, obviously, if, if your condition change, if you have a lot of flow, you can affect how these things take place as well. If you, have, if you don't have flow, you, if you're in stagnant water and you have another piece of material, and I gave the example of a pump. Uh, say I have um, brass here, some form of brass, and then I have steel. These two, if they are bolted together without a dielectric connection, you can have ion transfer and um, essentially accelerate severely the corrosion. In water, uh, you can expect um, somewhere, of the, it's in feet, how far you can interact between two metals that are in contact. So the, the, big, the very big submersible pump to, to let's say, feed the county for, for potable water, uh, even though it's 20 feet tall, what's on top, what's on bottom, does matter if it's all connected uh, metal on metal with, with bolts, especially if you don't have flow going through it. And that was the example I gave earlier. Um, this is a question probably to you is, is very obvious, but I did come across it and for one project I was actually paid to prove it, that when you lose material, uh, by general corrosion, if there's no embrittlement, um, whatever you're left with gives you, in whatever cross-section you're left with gives you the approximate tensile properties. So if you have wires um, in retaining walls, for example, and you're able to, 
sample them and figure out, okay, so I have half of the thickness left uh, or the diameter. Uh, well, for diameter, it means just a quarter of the strength. But um, if I, if it says to you work with the cross-sectional area and if it's only tension, you can use that as a, as a raw number. Now, you can see some limitations to this, and we'll get that later, where it's not all uniform. So if I take uh, a structure, I clean it up, I weigh it, I say, OK, I lost 20% of the weight. I, don't, I didn't lose only 20% of the strain, even if it's loaded in tension, because there'll be one area that's more corroded than the others. Um, when I say more, we tend to take that uh, say if you have an average of 20% that the local reduction, even if it's uni so-called uniform corrosion, is going to be about double. So that'd be 40% for that example I was giving you. Um, yes? So you're saying that the corrosion actually changes the material properties of the remaining good metal as well? It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't, but it's very hard. It's, it's hard to prove it because you have to clean off all the rust. Um, and it's also uh, misguiding because it's never really uniform. So if, if, you've, if you've lost only 20%, if you weigh your, your wires, you lost 20%, you probably have only 60% uh, of the original strength uh, because one area is going to be reduced. This is a big gasoline tank that I've looked at. It was about... 30 years old, maybe 40 years old. And in some areas, I could get the original thickness of the steel. Even at, you know, there was definitely more corrosion on the bottom side than on the top side. But even in the bottom, there were areas that were the original thickness and other areas that were completely perforated. Now, it wasn't leaking crazy because the soy it doesn't completely seal, but if you have a lot of clay in the soy, it will reduce the, uh, the leakage rate. So this was still being used, even though it had a bunch of holes in it. Um, the, the lesson learned here is you can't just go and probe at a few locations, a steel structure, and say, oh, OK, so I've lost so much of the strain. And that happens a lot for large structures. I worked on the a big uh, levee in, 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 uh, for the Connecticut River in Hartford where um, they used sheet piles to build the levee back, I would say, 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, they essentially keep having to make assessment as, as to how good the levee is and all that. And there are a lot of assumptions in their, in their soy model that depends on whether you have holes in the pile. So the pile is not only there for, for strength purposes to, to hold the soy, but whether the water goes freely through it or not makes a difference in terms of what, what's the retaining capacity of the soy itself. Uh, so it's relatively easy for them to figure out water level. They can just drill on each side. It's relatively hard if you're 60 feet down and you over kilometers around the river to determine what's the largest corrosion rate I've got and, and how big is that area that's affected. Um, you would hope that if, the, if, if, you know, if you can arrive to the conclusion it's fine right now, that you now protect it so things don't change anymore. But it does involve putting a lot of sacrificial anode or permanent anode along the length, connecting them to the pile and, and, and essentially trying to stop any further degradation. That's the beauty of cathodic protection. It can be retrofitted into a system. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, I'll say that although lots of time what you do is you combine the, um, the, the, um, the cathodic protection with a coating. So that way you don't need to utilize as much power to protect the structure. Most of it will be protected because of the coating, and then you have a little amount for where you have scratches, connections, that's, that's what you end up uh, protecting. So on pipes, that's what they do. Um, so just to give you an idea in terms of uh, how fast uh, you're going to lose thickness, this is um, a good literature review I did for a, a project. 
and I have some references here. This, this is something I wish I had when I started as a corrosion engineer. Um, the easiest number to remember, it's about four mils um, per year if you are submerged in water. So what happens in water is the rate of corrosion is limited by the supply of oxygen. See, you, there's, al there's always oxygen, but it's a limited amount, and the time to take it from the overall uh, oxygen in the water and have it react uh, at the corrosion front gives you a rate of about four mils. What that means is, unless you have a stainless steel, it doesn't matter too much how much alloying element you have you can't really improve the corrosion resistance of steel by just adding, say, 2% chrome, a few percent nickel, as opposed to just pure iron. It's, it's not going to vary much uh, with the, the, uh, the steel chemistry. Um, it's an advantage or a disadvantage. You, you could look at it both ways. And what, what I just said is also applicable in soy. There's no easy way in soy to just say, OK, I'm going to reduce the, the corrosion rate by trying to make the, uh, the protective oxide more uh, impermeable to the environment. You can do it um, for railroads and bridges if you use a weathering steel. So that steel goes through a cycle of process, just makes the surface oxide more stable and more resistant to, uh, to corrosion. So you still have some corrosion continuing to take place but it's at a lower rate and there's a special chemistry that allow you to do that. Those alloys turned out perform uh, not quite as good in soy and in water so I, I said it's about the same but it's actually a lo lower resistance. Uh, there's some interaction that just the same way that it's protective with cycles of wet and dry that, that that's what atmospheric is it's a disadvantage in, in soy and um, water. Um, so humid air, you know, it's a number less than if you're in water all the time. That's, that's a fair statement. The one way that you get rates that are greater than four mils per year is with salt water uh, by the ocean. And that's a, a number that goes up to about uh, 14 mils per year. So. 14 mils, it depends what you're thinking. You know, if you're thinking about a long-term structure, it's a big problem. If you talk about a few years, you're fine. Uh, that's essentially what you need to, to get out of this. Except if you have a galvanic effect uh, or there's also stray current. Uh, stray current essentially happens when you start having grounded connections. Buildings are grounded. So if you ground the building on one side and you have some metal exposed to the soil on the other side and the soil is at a different potential, you can accelerate the corrosion on that other side as opposed to not being connected at all. You're creating a battery uh, effect by, by just by doing that. It's important for pipelines, uh, this idea of stray currents. Uh, so you can sometimes protect one pipeline, but it's actually going to cause problem to the next one. So utility companies have to deal with that all the time. And uh, it's a very specialized field. And, and I would, that's, a, that's a comment I made to you after class yesterday, that in corrosion, um, there's a lot of experience. So if you really want to go out there and say, I'm going to do cathodic protection of pipeline. Well, you, there are a lot of people who've done it. And you better just get up to speed with all their experience. If you say, I want to do corrosion protection on a, a manufacturing plant, it's the same thing. In manufacturing, what happens in processing, if say you, you decide to make silicon and you have all sorts of stuff going around to make it, you, you need to know the history. What was used before and how the good did it, did it perform? And if you made a mistake, you know, when people try to make new processes, uh, a good, the example I know is making uh, magnesium processes to, to purify and, and, and make magnesium out of the ore. They, it was new technology and they didn't expect um, as bad of a corrosion, corrosion issues as they, they had. 
So what they had to do if this the after six months of running the process, they realized they've lost already 25% of the pipe thickness. Um, they put samples in of what they're thinking they want to use the next time, because the process is running to evaluate. It's it's essentially a side by side comparison. Is this alternative material going to perform better than the other? So if you have the pipe, the, the you essentially insert a rack with physical samples in it and it and the, and the fluid goes through it and it tells you it, it's not perfect but it gives you a good idea which material which alloy may be suitable uh, so if when it's your first time doing it it's a lot harder now the good news is if all you do is really a special uh, design or special construction there are not that many people that really know what how to do it uh, so when it comes to just a regular application, a building, a bridge, th those things are not as regulated as the pipeline and the manufacturing industry. So you end up having to think about the fundamentals, so what I'm trying to present to you. And then obviously if, if there's some history, if you know that you know, there's another product that's being used in similar condition, it performs in a similar way. Like for example, hot dip galvanizing in soy would you know, for drainage purposes, drain pipe will last somewhere around 50 years. There's going to be a lot of variation, but it gives you some idea on how to start with. And then you're thinking, well, you know, I want to build this. It, it's going to be at least 20 years. You know, if, 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 you, if you bury hot dip galvanized steel and it doesn't make 20 years, there's something else going on. There's some streaker and there are other causes uh, to explain what's happening. So. The two areas of corrosion where there's a lot of very specific expertise, the processing industry and the, the pipeline, so distribution of natural gas, oil, and water as well is, is very well developed. All the cast iron people, um, ductile iron for, for, for potable water. Okay. Um, the galvanic series is something you've probably seen a number of times. It essentially tells you uh, what you can do in terms of improving um, the favoring one material as opposed to the other. So if you have a, a connection, uh, you try to make the small piece, the fastener, with a greater uh, potential for, for being noble than the, the base material that's larger. Uh, and it, the one advantage specifically of stainless steel is not only passivated stainless steel, so a good stainless steel is processed correctly, it hasn't been somehow you know, blasted or anything like that, will give you uh, a, a more noble potential, but also it's not going to react much. It's not going to corrode a whole lot in, in, in a normal situation, and therefore it's not going to transfer much corrosion by a galvanic interaction. And that's what you're trying to do. If you do copper, like a copper impeller, the copper wants to corrode. If, if you see your impeller, it's very shiny. It's because it's transferring the corrosion to something else. So the, the, it, it, the two issues of the, the potential difference is one, but also how fast is this, if it was left alone, will it you know, form a passive layer? If it doesn't, uh, Alum so aluminum and stainless are two materials that you can more easily put in a galvanic situation without having a problem. The library tower um, is being in a lot of renovation and one of the issues is um, connecting the, uh, the armature to so the inner frame that's um, wrought iron was done a long time ago so it's not even steel. Um, wrought iron is essentially has very very low carbon um, but it, it's 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 processed the same way in terms of it's, it's cast and it was rolled into shapes you just have very very long inclusions so it tends to be uh, more susceptible to delamination than than modern steel but other than that you know it's it, it works um, 
So what happens here is exactly what I mentioned a couple times in our examples. You have copper and, and, and iron, and at that connection, you get a lot more, even though it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's not directly exposed, there'll be moisture, there'll be, there'll be water coming in, and you have a lot of buildup from the, the transfer of the reaction from the copper to the wrought iron. Um, it would be, in this case, one way to try to avoid this is to avoid the electrical contact because you can't really completely eliminate the environment, but even that is very difficult. So I, the, the, the way they show it here is the, you expect the armature to be touching at other locations even though it, it doesn't have fasteners and that will still make the electrical connection, the problem with it, it even if it's a long range, it still works. It doesn't have to be nearby. It's the electrolyte that needs to be in a very close vicinity. Um, in terms of pitting, um, this is an example. It was public housing here in Boston that I worked on. Get to the, um, the mechanical room and uh, different places in the building, between the buildings, you see these pipes. They have a lot of whitish residue on them. And um, they had a few leaks, but it wasn't terrible, you know, in terms of leakage. They, they, they had some issues um, that, were, that were the reason why I, I had to go there. But um, what I found out is I looked at these, and they looked very, very much like coming out of the, of the pipe as opposed to being just something that was sprayed from construction, so, because that happens too. Uh, if you're in a building, there'll be like insulation sprayed into your pipes and then you, you don't have to worry about that. But this, it turns out, you're looking here at a cross section from the inside out. It's pitted all the way through, but it, it sealed itself. Um, so that's an example where all together, and if you look at it from the inside, you see it's almost drilled. You see the four little holes. I don't know if it shows here. Yeah, it's not the best. So what happened is um, when you reach the end, eventually you, you, the, the situation with the anode and cathode changes, and it just stops. You get the chlorides. There's a chloride cell that happens when you when you form that pitting with copper, and when you get through the hole, now you're starting to remove some of that potential, and you you can stop the process. So um, it's it was clear that by the time you had perforation, that the localized corrosion was now transferring to other locations. Um, now. There are multiple reasons why it all started here. And one of them was flow rate and the amount of residue. They were running a hot, hot water boiler with a lot of volume at, at specific times through the day, so in the morning, in the evening. And that was essentially taking some settlement from the boiler into the pipes. And one way to mitigate it that was actually simple is just to put filters. Uh, so you reduce the amount of residue. So it's clean here, but there, there was a big residue in that area on the inside that was uh, that initiated the process of pitting corrosion. Um, this is a steel pipe, and it doesn't look that great, but it's not really uncommon. Um, we call them tubercle, and they form, uh, they initiate locally, even if you don't have physical deposits, if your water has enough uh, dissolved solid and your flow rate is slow enough um, and you have oxygen, that's, that's what will happen eventually in, in, in uh, HVAC pipes. Now, you can use inhibitors to prevent that. Um, so this is one area that is a little different than what I've talked to you most in the class. When you can control the environment, it's great. You know, you know, it only happens in closed system, but if you can, it's it's a big advantage. I, I, I give you an example where I showed you the PEX tubing stuff. So when we had these PEX pipe, and I said they had the aluminum to prevent oxidation from from coming in, that was to prevent this this type of corrosion from from starting in sections of pipe that were metallic. 
because it's very rare that you have a system that's completely plastic. You always end up with uh, fittings. They try to do fittings out of plastic, but valves, there's, there's some components close to the boiler, hot water heaters that will be metallic and in every plumbing system. So that's, that was the reason if you're gonna have circulating hot water, you try to minimize the, the amount of oxygen you keep bringing in. So this, this issue tends to come up if you have um, a cooling towel that is aerated. So you had the water and you cool it down that way um, or you heat it up depending if it's a winter or a summer. So if it's an open, we call it an open loop system uh, that would always bring back some oxygen, so it makes life a lot harder. But you can, again, it's open loop, but it's the same water. So if you use inhibitors, you need to keep adding to it, but it's much better than having to deal with this. This is only a couple of years old, and it was just what it wasn't working. Um, copper is uh, very particular. Um, we use it a lot for plumbing, but the, the oxide on copper, on copper is only going to be stable below a certain velocity of the water. So there's a condition if you have too much water velocity where you're going to uh, erode off fittings mostly. So when you have turbulence, um, it's, it happens quite a bit. So you can see here how thin the wall was on the, on the outer curve as opposed to the inner curve on that, on that cut. It's, it's just, I did say that at the beginning, that there are a lot of things that you have to take into account when you're going to say, OK, I'm going to use this. So for copper, you worry about the rate uh, that the water is going through with, with um, steel pipes. You really need to, to know, is this going to be potable water? Is this going to be recirculating water? Is it going to be a closed loop, an open loop, and all these conditions that really going to make a difference at the end of the day? If you can control the environment, most of the time, the inhibitors, and if it's a closed system, the inhibitors are a good alternative. Um, we use them in um, fire sprinkler pipes uh, quite a bit. Fire sprinkler pipes, you can decide that if you, when you're not using it, you pressurize it with air so you don't have to worry about corrosion. The problem is if your system is such that you can't drain all the pipes, it makes things worse because wherever you have some water left, you keep pushing pressurized oxygen into the area and you're going to have leaks more quickly and that, that happens a lot. So. If you're going that route, you really have to make sure you have a lot of drainage. So the supply of oxygen, I guess, would be a one way to think about it. For a lot of the corrosion of steel, the supply of oxygen is an important factor to take into account. Um, when we go to stainless steel, it's a little different because the stainless steel gets protected by the reaction. So if you have very low oxygen, there are conditions where the stainless steel will start to corrode just like regular steel. And that happens in the soil sometimes. If you're deep enough below the water table, you can have stainless steel starting to corrode like your regular steel because it's not forming that protective oxide anymore. The same would be applicable to aluminum, actually. You need a continuous reaction, right? Because it, when we think about Putting it in the soil, a lot of times, you know, it's if it's a pile, it's driven, uh, or if it's you know if it's if it's really a transportation pipe, there's going to be rocks and all sorts of things, tools that are going to damage it significantly. And you, you'd like to think that you can passivate stainless steel um, in a very controlled way, and it's still going to be good for service, but because of workmanship issues, it becomes very difficult to just rely on that. Um, so there are ways you can permanently damage stainless steel in a shop, and I'm going to cover that in the next section. But there's no easy way that you can really make it that much better than what it is to begin with. Uh, organic coating. So th th this is the negative view of it, and then we'll go to the positive view. We talked about it already yesterday, so I, I'm going to be a little brief on it. Um, most of the time, the coating is going to take off where you need it. <laughs> in areas where you have high stresses because of 
you know, thermal ex differential thermal expansion, every corner is where the paint will tend to disconnect from, from, uh, from your structure more quickly. It's just, you know, bad coincidence. Um, so here you're looking as a, essentially a gouge in the, in the connection. And some of it could just be the, uh, the welding procedure itself. But some of it is essentially some welding defects combined with corrosion and time that just made the piece come off. Um, it was probably a brittle zone. This is a very high stress zone and um, there was already one crack and we had to reinforce this, this connection to make sure that there wasn't going to be any problem. Now, if you're serious, because you can be like, oh yeah, we'll paint it so it looks good. If you're serious about it, you can get I think, I think some epoxies get you to about 20, 25 year life, even if it's a relatively aggressive environment. But again, it's by controlling the supply of oxygen at your reaction layer. And I mentioned about uh, using galvanizing um, close to the, to the steel. So say I have steel and I somehow I'm able to put a zinc wrench primer. So I have some zinc particle here, and then I have a very thick hard coat that's, that's very resistant to the penetration of oxygen. So what I'm doing is I'm really trying to slow down the movement of the oxygen into my system uh, and humidity as well. Um, when I get to that interface, if now I can have a sacrificial protection, it's great. But you have to t keep in mind that one base principle is the only way the, the zinc is going to protect the, uh, the steel here is if it's an electrical contact. So when you have um, a zinc rich primer, you, you, there are differences whether it's organic, inorganic, and how much zinc really there is into it because it's affecting how much of that zinc is going to be doing something, anything, as opposed to just being standing there. If, if, you, if it's not in electrical contact, if I have a zinc particle right here, yeah, you know, it, maybe it's going to pick up a little bit of oxygen, but it's going to become protected, self-protected. And the, the oxygen is going to continue to go through, get to your interface. So I wanted to take this example here where, so you have the steel, you have a primer, and you have a top coat. And then I realized that they uh, made a mistake of adding, uh, a zinc rich primer here after the regular primer and it's discussed in the, uh, on the website there that it's just a terrible idea it just didn't do anything it just made things worse actually because they had some, some more reaction it was more permeable uh, to go between the, the primers so the top area here is just for mounting purposes so we're looking at a cross section of everything you have the steel at the bottom and then the, the, the end of the part was right here so it's it's very basic principle that now, hopefully with the video and me talking about it in details, you get to remember because it allows you to make sense because I can't teach you everything. I can only teach you, you know, just a few things. And then you have to go on your own if you ever want to do anything in that, in that area. Or at least be aware of what you know and what you don't know <laughs> is I guess one, one of the purpose here. Um, galvanizing. That's, that's a topic that came up yesterday, and, and, and here we, we have it. We have it all together. We actually have a link here to our thermal spray process. When you metallize, you use an arc and you project the, uh, the zinc on, on the surface. Um, but not, it's not a thermal spray process, the metallization, where you have a small droplet, like I talked about. It's really a large quantity of metals. It's just being pushed to the surface. The, the conventional way, if you say, I want a long life, is to go out, build your structure out of steel, dip it in the, in, in the zinc. Well, it has to be clean and all that. But you dip it in the zinc, and what it does, it, it's, it's protecting everything at the same time. All your welds and all your basic structure gets protected. There are some limitations in terms of, uh, you know, are you going to put holes in the end so you have the zinc being able to protect the inside or not? Or you really cap it so it doesn't protect the inside? One thing you have to keep in mind, if I have a tube of steel, 
um, and I go and I put zinc inside and out, unless this is really a, a, a submerged condition where the two of them are really well, there are a lot of holes and they're connected, you can only use the zinc on the outside to protect you from the outside and the zinc from the inside to protect you from the inside. Because the electrolytes, they're not going to communicate. They'll have to go all around, maybe in the end of the tube and come back in. So these are isolated. So if you need a protection on the inside because you think you're going to have some infiltration, you have to put it in, but you can't say, oh, whatever, it, whatever the zinc is needed, it's going to go. It's the same principle electrical and electrolyte but a lot of engineers are going to ask you that question um, all sorts of people just see, because they don't they don't feel uh, comfortable with the base principle uh, that I've been talking to you in the last class now so the zinc paint again there are a number of them uh, there's, on, there's only so much efficiency you get out of it um, if you go to a store and it says galvanized Unless it says hot dip galvanized and that you actually see the grains, typically it's a, just a very thin um, electro electroplated galvanizing. And what happens is this is done in a continuous process. So you have your sheet metal, you unroll it, clean it, get it to go through your zinc bat, and then you shave it off and you have normally, if this is automotive, you have a process after the fact where you heat it up and that makes the surface rougher and it changes the, the structure of the zinc to allow a better adhesion of the paint. And so I always, I, I like you guys to understand it's not all about corrosion protection. Uh, they put the galvanizing uh, okay, but they, they essentially oxidize it quite a bit. So it only has a fraction of the potential for protection that it had at the beginning to be to make sure paint's not gonna flake off. That's that's the most important thing, and you can get a nice finish. Um, so sheet galvanizing uh, will only give you so if it's exposed, it will give you a few years typically, and that's what happens also with fasteners. If you have fasteners that are not of this kind, hot dip galvanized, they just have a regular.